Uh, hi, everybody. Hi, guys here. Hi, everyone on the internet. Um, this is a very interesting time, to say the least. What a mess this camera has made of things, right? I mean, it's been just a little over a year since this thing came out. This is the Canon 5D Mark II. And a year ago, or a year and a half ago, uh, I was a 20-year uh, uh, veteran of photography, I guess. I don't know if veteran is the right word, but uh, I'd been around for a little while uh, as a photographer working for the New York Times and other publications. And I picked up this camera at Canon, took three friends with me, and went out to shoot uh, over two nights in uh, New York City. Um, and uh, shot a short, I call it a bad cologne commercial, called Reverie. <laughs> and I would never have imagined that uh, a year and a half later or so, maybe a little bit more than that, I'd find myself here doing a live broadcast with 2,000 people watching from all over the world talking about HD DSLR cinema. You've got to remember these things weren't out, you know, a year and a half, two years ago. Um, you had to use these clunky camcorders uh, or have a fortune or go to film school to be able to use a film camera. And now you have these uh, people from all over the world uh, photographers, filmmakers jumping in head first into this new uh, realm of cinema. And that's a pretty fascinating time. Uh, it's also pretty fascinating that we're doing this. You know, we've got eight people here watching me live who hopefully won't fall asleep and a few thousand more people online. And it's, it's really exciting. It's a little freaky to have, you know, this thing going out live to all these people. So welcome. Um, and I think we're just going to go ahead and kick it off and, and get going. Um, there's the first slide. And um, today we're going to start slow. And I think one of the main points I wanted to make is that you see a lot of gadgets and gear behind me. That's cool. I know you all want to see this. It's going to come. So every little gizmo you see back here, uh, almost every single thing that I can get my hands on that has been either invented or reinvented over the past two years, we're going to talk about and show to you one at a time. And people who've never shot video are going to be introduced to things they've never seen before. And I think people who have quite a bit of experience are going to discover new tools they've never seen before. Uh, we're also going to go over the high-end gear, the middle-level gear, and the low-end gear. So if you're just starting and you don't have you know, a few hundred or a few thousand dollars to throw into this, more likely a few thousand, uh, we're going to talk about ways to just get started. This is gear that allows you to make quote-unquote professional-looking video. But I think the main concept I wanted to get through right now is that the key to successful filmmaking is not this, okay? The key to successful filmmaking is content. There's a very big differentiation between what a still photograph is and what a film is. And we're going to talk about that a little bit because I know a lot of you are photographers who are now transitioning into this motion world. And there's a lot of really important differences in terms of the way you think, in terms of the way you interact with people, in terms of the way you put things together. But if there's one thing that's absolutely pivotal that you can never lose sight of, is that whether it's a music video, to a lesser degree, but a short film, a narrative film, a documentary, it's all about the content. If no matter how glitzy, no matter how steady your steady cam move is, no matter how beautiful your lighting is, if there's no content there, if there's no concept, no story, no screenplay, I can guarantee you very quickly people will lose interest immediately. And given the amount of time and effort and resources you're going to put into this, this is one of the most important concepts I really want to start off with. I know a lot of you out there want me to start playing with these things right away. That's how I would be. And I've got to tell you, I spent my first year in this realm studying all this gear. I was involved with trying to develop it with a lot of manufacturers. You've got to remember, this stuff didn't exist two years ago, literally. So it was uh, an effort to try to make this happen. This is about not only telling a story, but getting an, some sort of emotional response uh, with your audience. It's about making a connection. When you make a photograph, you're trying to do that as well, but it's on a very different level. Um, let's talk quickly about that, the photograph versus the motion picture. Here's an image you see here. And there it goes. I did that on purpose, because that's what happens with the film. There's a very distinct dif difference between film and a photograph. A photograph exists. It's a still image that doesn't move. And there's a very key difference between a still photograph and film. When you think about, for example, some big events in history, like 9-11, 
While you may remember the looping video of the planes crashing in the towers, most people that I knew back then when I was a photographer at the New York Times would react to the images and remember some very key images from that event. And there's a reason for that. It's not a question of whether the still image is more powerful than film, which it can be at times. It's more of a question how you consume that on your end. When you think about it, we live in a world where there's Twitter, you know, Facebook, email, web, TV. It's going at such a fast pace. And the still photograph is one of the few times you stop and stare and think. It's one of the very few things that we do as an audience where we actually pause for one moment in the day. It could be five seconds in the morning on your paper. It could be two minutes staring at a photograph on an iPad. That's a very pivotal and key difference between the way you as a photographer are trying to reach your audience with that one decisive moment versus creating a film. So obviously with the photograph the image obviously doesn't move. I mean, it's very basic, but don't forget that because you've got to capture a perfect image. Think about it. When I would go out into the field, I would say to myself, I've got to get that one image today that's going to show up on the front page of the New York Times that tells the entire story of the day in one image that has multiple layers of information or perhaps just one. But whatever that one image is, it doesn't matter what the entire 24 hour experience that I have is. It's all about that one pinnacle moment that is not only hopefully aesthetically pleasing, that's beautiful, or visually, you know, engaging. It's about the content and the story behind it as a photographer. Some of you may have heard the term the decisive moment. Henri Cartier-Bresson coined this. He's the father of photojournalism. And the idea for him was that in any activity, there's a pinnacle, there's an apex, where everything comes together in an absolutely magical way. As photographers, we obsess about capturing that moment and never, we never forget that it will never, ever happen again. That's the magic and the challenge of, say, a photojournalist. And to be true, whether you're a filmmaker or a photographer, there's always going to be that decisive moment. And you have to be ready to capture it. That moment has no saturation in terms of the audience. That's what you can't forget as well. As a photographer, you tend to get a, very, a bit obsessive about how your final product is, how every single shot is. Remember that as a film, these shots fly through in front of the audience. They move from one to the next to the next to the next. So while you definitely want to make, concentrate on making those perfect shots by shots by shots, don't forget how long they may last on that screen. And how perhaps what's much more important is as opposed to having 30 or 40 shots strung together perfectly each, it's how they relate to one another and how they move the audience. And a very key important point, I believe that a still image can live on beauty alone. In other words, a photograph need not say much to be effective. If you take a beautiful photograph of the sunset, there's not necessarily anything groundbreaking about the sun rising or setting every day. It happens every day and hopefully you can see it if there isn't cloud cover. But people for some reason will stare at that photograph put it on their wall because it has some sort of connection with them. Every one of your audience members have a, has a different connection with that photograph. They can make their own opinion out, about it. There's no distraction, there's no music. It's not starting and beginning and ending somewhere. It's just there to be seen and watched. It's very different than film. When we go into the motion picture, it's, it's a body, it's a whole. It starts somewhere and goes at a very fixed speed to a certain end. And people, how many people pause your films? How often, granted we have TiVo now, we have the pause button on Blu-ray players on our Macs or whatever it is, but that's not the way film is con consumed. People don't, you know, unless you're like film students or real big critics, pause your scene and rewind it and deconstruct it. They just passively sit back and watch it. So in general, when you go watch a film or TV, you tend to slouch back in your couch and consume it. Basically, you're letting go. You're a lot less intellectually engaged, perhaps, than when you're wa looking at a photograph. And you're, being, you're basically hoping to be taken on some sort of experience, some sort of emotional or cognitive experience from start to finish. In other words, the filmmaker is, in many ways, doing all the thinking for you and trying to take you on a certain path. It's really, really key as you guys that are either already filmmakers, 
becoming filmmakers or transitioning into film, never forget this fact that you are performing through your camera and the people in front of it and the subject matter to an audience that is going to be passively consuming this. And of course, one of the major concepts of film is it's made up of a lot of different parts. And the whole is always much greater than the individual parts. Never forget, when you watch the Academy Awards and they show you a scene without the music track on it, it really just goes Mwah, really quick. When they add sound effects, when you see a fantastic actor, you know, uh, Inglorious Bastards uh, was a film for me recently that just showed how incredible writing and acting can really steal the show. And to me, this is a really important point as you transition from still to photography. You have to have that content, you have to have that connection. And while making a beautiful photograph is, can make you a very successful photograph, making a beautiful film alone doesn't quite cut the mustard. In fact, you'll find, ironically, that you'll lose your audience much more quickly with a very beautiful film with no content than a film with a tremendous story or script that is horrible technically. And that's a very, very, very important point. It's simple, but content in film is absolutely key. And just to be clear over this next three days, when I say film, that could be a music video, it could be a documentary, it can be a webcast. It's all about the moving image. And I'm just using film as kind of a, an overall overarching uh, term. And the visual, and this is something that was very hard for me as a filmmaker, or uh, becoming a filmmaker, I don't know, as I mentioned earlier, I was a photographer for 20 years, is that as a photographer, the image was absolutely sacrosanct. I worked with fantastic reporters, with fantastic art directors who would put everything together on the web or on the newspaper. But my only goal as a photographer was making that still image sing and connect with people. As a filmmaker, the visual is very much a part of the whole. And the big difference is, to me as a photographer, if you make a fantastic still image, it can stand on its own, and visuals are king, obviously. In film, visuals are not king. They're really part of the puzzle. And more importantly, they're somehow less important than the content. And that's hard for any, any still photographer going into film to realize that their art, their visual art, can come very secondary to the written word, in this case the screenplay, or the concept, or the music. Remember how many movies you've seen out there that may, you remember because of the music, because of the soundtrack, or because of the dialogue, or the lines. A very different level of interacting with people. So, that's it in terms of theory. Um, I think I needed to hit on that, because if you just start diving into this, the point is these are tools that help you make a better film, hopefully. We'll talk about how having too much gear, like this, can actually really slow you down and in effect make you a terrible filmmaker because you focus on technique. <coughs> We've all seen the Hollywood blockbusters these days that have every single special effect. Unbelievable crane moves, unbelievable uh, three, 3D or CGI. We walk out of there entertained, but sometimes we leave there with absolutely no connection emotionally or intellectually. And people say, how was it? And you kind of go, uh, it, was, it was entertaining, maybe. Okay, I wanted to talk a little bit about um, what photographers might be experiencing as they go into filmmaking. And I think these are very basic concepts that you probably already know, but until you make this transition, um, you're not going to really think about. As a photographer, for 20 years, it was about me picking up the camera and going out there and finding a photograph. Other than checking with the reporter that I was working with, or the editor about the story, um, it was all about my finding a visual way to tell a story. And I guess more importantly, the key is, you don't have to work with a reporter or anyone as a photographer. You can really just go out there and do your own thing. And you can be extremely successful by yourself as a still photographer with no support from anyone. And think about that. That attracts a certain type of person, right? Kind of the solo personality, the, in the rugged individualist. There's a reason photographers have never unionized or have no rules <laughs> or have no set rates. It's because they don't talk to one another. Of course we do. But it attracts a certain kind of renegade personality that doesn't really want to fit in society, doesn't really want to talk to people. They say, you know what? 
don't talk to me. I want to be a fly on the wall. I don't want to interact with you. You know, I'm very happy in my element. You know, some people don't even like people. They go out and they shoot sunrises and landscapes. You know, I go in helicopters sometimes when I want to be away from people because I don't talk to anyone. I just interact with what's down there. I have absolutely no interaction in the way of affecting what's happening uh, 1,500 or 2,000 feet below. But it's a different type of personality. Whereas a filmmaker, a director, a DP, anyone, an, an actor, it's about finding people and working with them. It's about getting along with them. And most importantly, it's about understanding that to a certain degree, and I don't want to get too complex too quickly, you can make your own films all by yourself. You can make a fantastic film of raindrops and cityscapes and have a mute actor who doesn't say anything and follow them around if you even have actors. So you can get away with that, of course. But for the most part, as you get into filmmaking or documentaries, it's about collaborating with others. You're going to have someone who's helping you with a second camera or your camera. Someone who's helping you with lighting, perhaps, or with audio. You no longer just go out, pick up your camera, and go. And I used to have, while I was still a photographer only, filmmakers come up to me and say, man, I really wish I had your job. And I would go, I wish I had your job. You guys got all the cool toys, you got all these cool lights, you got these big budgets. I'm just here with my little camera, you know, my little 35 millimeter lens and still camera. And I've got nothing else. I've got no assistants, no PAs, nothing, no cool special effects. I want to be you. And they're like, we want to be you. And I'm like, why? Why would you want to do that? And they would always say, because you just get to pick up your camera and go make your shot. You don't have to talk to anyone. You don't have to clear it with anyone. You don't have to ask for permission. You don't have to discuss it. Just go ahead and do it. And they were yearning for that liberty. Well, I was yearning for the collaboration. I was surrounded by films since I was a kid. My first memory, my, my father was a set photographer. He worked for Premier Magazine. My very first memory in life is of two Mercedes, you know, driving two stunt cars, crashing into each other as machine gun fire was shooting them up, you know, with, with fake bullets. That's my very first cognizant memory as a child. So I was on, on sets, you know, with Bertolucci, with my father taking pictures of the set. And I was surrounded by that. And it's been a very important part of who I am. So I've always known that at some point in my career, I'd want to transition into film. Reverie happened as a fluke. I saw the camera. I saw the quality of what was coming out of it. And I said, I got to get my hands on that 5D Mark II prototype. It wasn't meant to come to me. And we'll get to that in a second. But this key up here, I think you guys all need to pause on. Because some of you that are watching are going to watch this workshop. You're successful photographers. You're beginning <laughs> photographers. And at the end of this workshop, you may go, you know what? Filmmaking simply isn't for me. It's not what drives me. I like that feeling of getting up at 4 o'clock in the morning or starting at midnight and going out there by myself with absolute quiet and finding my image. No one's breathing down my neck saying, you know, when's the next shot? You know, the actor's not ready. Uh, the lighting's terrible. You know, we're not transitioning fast enough. You're on your own with a small bag, if you even have a bag. As a filmmaker, it's quite a bit different. And I tell people in my workshops that I do, if one or two of you leave this workshop, or 100 or 200 on the web, saying, I don't want to ever do film. It's just not for me. I think that's OK. I think that I've done you, hopefully, I think, a service by showing you what's involved and scaring you off. Not for the purpose of scaring you off, but to help you realize that this may just not be for you. Because there's a certain kind of personality that's attracted to photography and a certain kind of personality that's attracted to film. And there's a lot of overlap. It doesn't necessarily mesh at all. Also, as a photographer, the beauty of it, for me, is that you go out there without any plan sometimes. Sometimes you're working on a story. Sometimes you're working on an essay or a book or a theme that you're looking to illustrate. It tends to be on a more advanced level for photographers. But you can literally, the beauty of it is, pick your camera up and have absolutely no clue what you're going to shoot that day. That's what drew me to photojournalism and street photography. And I was 15 and I started you know, shooting uh, as, as a still photographer. Um, I would just go out in the street in New York, of New York and take one camera, one lens. The only thing I owned, I had a 50 millimeter lens and a few rolls of Tri-X black and white, and I'd walk around and find pictures. And there's something really kind of cool about that. It's kind of like meditating if you get into that zone. You can go walking for 8, 10, 12 hour days, and granted your legs are going to kill you at the end of the day. Your back may kill you. If your camera's heavy, you have lots, lots of gear on you. But you can walk out of there absolutely refreshed. Okay. 
Whereas a filmmaker in general is severely much more proactive. It's a lot more of pre-production, a lot more of thinking in advance about what you're going to do. It's a different kind of mental exercise. You know, you can go out there and shoot nature shows. That's one thing. But even then, you've got to figure out how to get the gear over there, what gear to get over there, visas, customs, all that fun stuff. That uh, I've got to be honest, I hate that stuff. I, I really respect logistics, and I'm, I, I was actually one of the parts I was really good at as a photojournalist in trying to kind of, um, for example, when I covered Katrina, I would help photographers coming in and make sure they had their sat phones ready, their water, a roll of quarters because cell phones didn't work, and you couldn't call collect from New Orleans. You know, logistics are always very important. But you know what? I'm never more excited than when there's something beautiful happening in front of the camera, and we're lucky enough to capture it. That's what really drives me. So as a filmmaker, it's kind of a different thing mentally. Don't, don't, uh, we see that. And I think we already talked about this. The idea of picking up a camera and running out is something you do every day as a photographer. As a filmmaker, you may need that tripod and that fluid head. You may need some sort of device to handhold it. You may need a loop. It's a different process. The beauty of it is that these new cameras, for the first time, allow you to pick up a still camera, in effect, and shoot full HD video with out of the box. We'll talk about all, all the next three days about how to make it more professional, the ergonomics, etc. But at least you can do that. But you'll find it's not as easy as turning on a camcorder. You know, and we'll get to that a little bit later. So let's talk about key building blocks. We already talked about the story and the concept. All right. I'm not, I, there's a reason I'm repeating this over and over again, is that you know, we have to, before you get started, really think about what the final product is in a film. All right, you've got to realize it's going to be a whole, it's going to come together. And in many ways, you're kind of like a chef going out to shop in the morning for your ingredients. But unless you know what you're going to cook that night, it's kind of scary to go to the market and randomly pick um, ingredients. And don't forget that as photographers, it's kind of what we do. You might just go and shoot a beautiful sunrise in the morning, then a photojournalism piece of someone walking through a slit of light in the street, then we might take a portrait. We might pull out a tilt shift lens and go on a roof of the building and make a cool tilt shift photograph that have absolutely no relationship from one to the next. As a filmmaker, uh, it really tends to help you to know what you're going to make that night or at the end of the project. Motion uh, is a big one. The definition of photography is the recording of light. Okay, in other words, a camera uh, records light onto a still image. Some of you may not know that the first 35 millimeter still cameras made by Leica, in order to process just a small part of 35 millimeter motion picture film. In other words, back in the day when they were shooting uh, full you know, motion pictures, they didn't want to have to process an entire spool of film to see their exposure. So they would cut a little bit of it, put it in a Leica, shoot a picture, process just that small piece of film, and that's how 35 millimeter was eventually, eventually born. Okay, way after the daguerreotype and all that fun stuff. Um, the definition of cinematography is the recording of motion. Again, it's a very obvious thing that there's motion in film, but you can't forget the fact that it's not just the fact that things are moving in front of your camera, it's also today how you move the camera itself. That's one of the absolute biggest key points in modern filmmaking. All of this, I call this junk behind me. The jibs, the mounts, the cranes, the fluid heads, all are tools that help you move the camera in a certain professional looking way. Okay? They're tools that allow you to get from point A to point B in a very smooth fashion. Your goal as a filmmaker is to understand that it's not just about moving the camera randomly, but you move the camera for a purpose. You're telling the story with that movement. You're trying to engage your audience and get a certain type of emotion from them by the way you move or don't move that camera. And that is an entire study of things. You know, people will talk about, you know, the fact that if you pan from left to right, a Western audience is going to feel much more comfortable than if you pan from right to left. Think about how simple that is. Go left to right, just look at your screen, and it feels right. Go right to left, it feels slightly uncomfortable because we've been taught to read from left to right. And for some of you out there, that may be just a totally new concept you never thought about. I can admit to, prior to reading books about it, I would never have thought. As a photographer, well, do I pan left to right or right to left? That's kind of like an A or B option. But if you want to create some sort of stress in your piece, go right to left. Same way if you go from top to bottom 
on your frame from top left to bottom right. This is called screen direction, by the way. Your audience is going to feel like, if, in other words, someone walks from the stairs on your, on your, on your short, from the top of the left stairs down to the right, like it's an inevitable journey. It feels comfortable. Whatever is coming is coming really naturally. Whereas if you tilt and pan from bottom left to upper right, it feels forced. It feels like a difficult journey. Okay? And that's just the way you move the camera on a stationary pivot point. There is a tremendous amount of theory behind this, and I find it absolutely fascinating. We're going to touch on some of that in the next few days, but only some of it. You know, you can buy a good, good book on screenwriting um, out there, and I'll, I'll try to remember to, to point you towards one that I find that's pretty awesome. Sound. I've done a, quite a few workshops, and I get the team, and we go to shoot, and we're shooting our very first shot, and we roll, and someone yells action, and they start the scene. And I'll stop them and say, did you forget something? And they look at me dazed, and I go, is anyone recording sound? <laughs> as photographers, uh, and as less so filmmakers, uh, you have to respect the fact that 50% of the information going to your audience, 50%, half of the information is going through their ears. When you go to a film, or you watch it on TV, you consume it with your eyes and your ears. You don't smell it, you can't feel it, um, not yet. Uh, you, you have seats now being made that will move you as you watch your, your blockbuster film at home. I've seen those. Uh, you have olfactory things coming, smells, that'll be there at some point, and different temperatures. A lot of technology being developed for that. You're going to have holographic images some days. We have 3D going on now, which is a big craze. But don't forget that sound is so important. And if you really want to break down what differentiates a motion picture blockbuster film from an indie, the number one factor, people will tell you, is the quality of the audio. It's how good the audio is on the actors, the foley, people making sounds, and the soundtrack. So don't forget sound. It's absolutely key. We'll go over some, some tools. And then editing. There's one thing that I think any photographer knows. You either have it in the can, or you don't. And perhaps the can is a wrong term here now that we're talking about film. But you either have the picture or you don't. And one of the hardest lessons that I would learn as a photographer with some veteran photojournalists and other photographers is they would say, and it's, I have an editor uh, at a company called Allsport who was named Daryl Ingham, who would look at your photographs and he would go, it's just not there, mate. It's <laughs> just not there. I'm so sorry, but it's just not there. And what he meant was the photograph is almost there. It's so close to being right, but you didn't get it. And the most frustrating thing about being a photographer is you can't fix that. Sure, you can crop it in a certain way, you can grade it or color correct it in a certain way, but ultimately if the image was missed or not there, it's, it's so uh, unforgiving that there's absolutely nothing you can do to get it back. And that's what makes the job of being a photographer sometimes quite stressful is you, know, you have one chance to get it, it's also what makes it incredibly exhilarating when you get the game-winning touchdown of the Super Bowl from the perfect angle at the perfect moment. That's what makes photography absolutely exhilarating. You seldom get that in film. And the key point is, even if it's not there in film, a good editor can very often fix it, or you can go reshoot it. Different concept entirely. So editing is absolutely one of the single most important things in film. Uh, when I first saw the first cut of Reverie, on the second time I watched it, I found it boring, the way it was initially edited, because it was edited to the original storyboards that we had. I wouldn't even call them storyboards, we did it in such a rushed fashion. But when you as a filmmaker look at your little short and you're bored with it on the second try, you know you're in severe, severe trouble. And I told the editor, Andre Costantini, is this the way you edit it? You would edit it if you had been asked to do it on your own. And you very politically said, you know, very adeptly said, no, not necessarily the way I would approach it. And I'd seen a little uh, series of shots that he'd cut together. And I saw it was really cool. It was very nonlinear. And I said, we've got seven hours. I'll let you do your edit. Because I don't, what I see here, I don't want to show it to anyone. As, and I'll, let you, I'll give you free reign to do it however you want, as long as you promise me you make the deadline. And he, he went for it. So when we'll show you Reverie in a little bit, we look at it. Look at how absolutely nonlinear it is. It's not a traditional storyline. It's not the most fascinating storyline at all. 
but the way it's edited makes that piece come to life. That's a very key, important concept. I'm killing this point on story. And I'm sure people are going to say it, but um, <laughs> the success of a film, in my opinion, uh, will depend not only on the quality of the story or the message you're trying to communicate, whether it's the documentary or even a music video, although I really kind of step away from those because those can really just be people drumming on a guitar and just visually interesting and people focus on the music. But it's not only on the quality of the story, but also how you tell it. That's the other part of filmmaking and directing. Uh, you can have the most amazing story, and if you don't know how to tell it, guess what? It doesn't quite matter. So don't forget that last part of it. Um, you've got to know how to use lenses, how to use lighting, how to cut pieces together to make it fascinating. Motion, we discussed, is quite key. And um, realize that when the 5D Mark II came out, do you remember the amount of like, locked off or stationary shots that were out there with like Boca mm -hmm. or you know, out of focus lights in the background? I, I wanted to pick one out, but there's a chance the person might be listening or not, but there was one, I, I don't want to go too far into detail, that I remember watching. And, you know, I could feel the drool coming out of my mouth <laughs> as I watched it. Because it was just, you know, what's the Discovery Channel site that has all the sunrise and sunset for 30 minutes? Uh, you know what I'm talking about? Sunrise Earth. You know, uh, I can watch that for about 30 seconds until my eyes glaze over, okay? Uh, I still respect what they do. But when photographers get into film, they really get married to this idea of just having the camera locked off and not moving. And the reality is, not only is it weak storytelling in terms of filmmaking, but more to the point, you've got to remember that uh, our audience today, I mean, I don't know how many people have dropped off already um, just by their nature, uh, can, just has no attention span whatsoever. You've got to keep people interested. You've got to you know, keep the camera moving at all times to keep things happening. Remember the MTV days where the camera would move randomly around and shake for absolutely no reason just to make sure the young people watched? There's a reason for that, you know? Uh, I think we all have a bit of lizard brains these days where we just, you know, read something for 30 seconds, jump on the next Twitter, jump onto this, turn the TV on, da 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 And it's because we need these impulses. You know, it's a whole different discussion. I think it's a very destructive thing uh, overall, but it is what it is. So when you make a film, remember, you've got to keep the camera moving. Not just to tell a better story, which you can, but look at films these days and see how seldom you see locked off, a series of locked off shots. One stationary shot, another stationary shot, another stationary shot, another stationary shot. It doesn't really happen. You almost always have the camera moving or at the very least the subject moving from one shot to the next. There we go, I think I just said that. Oh, light. I think the single biggest challenge for what I would call an experienced photographer going into film is learning lighting. Um, for motion pictures. It is a very different beast. It's the exact same principles to a certain extent, but the tools and language could not be more different. You know, a lot of filmmakers don't know what a grid is. It's one of the most basic lighting tools that we have. They do have soft boxes, you know, they call them these chimeras. Uh, they do have hard and soft light, but for the most part, it is an entirely different vocabulary on an epic scale. So as you transition over into film, you're going to find that lighting is going to be one of your biggest challenges. Because you know how to light as a photographer. You don't necessarily know how to light as a videographer or a filmmaker. And uh, don't forget that when you light for a still image, you're lighting for this one shot. That's, you pick the perfect angle where the light lines up just right on the eye and the shadow is perfectly placed. Whereas in film, as your camera moves and your subject moves, things are constantly changing. And that's a really, really, really key point. Um, the light itself can move, you know, either because the subject is moving in between different spots of light or a spotlight is following them or not. Things you can't do in still photography, it's pretty fascinating. Sound. Uh, we talked about sound effects, dialogue, music, and how they're all part of this big filmmaking experience. Uh, for those of you that start off, I think uh, very few of you are going to have a good screenplay to go off of. Uh, most of you are going to be learning how to move the camera and how to cut things together. And you'll find how the most boring sequ sequence of images, or in this case shots, can absolutely be saved by a great soundtrack. All right, Because it takes you to an entirely new level. And uh, 
we're giving you this, pre people are taking notes in the audience, which is cool, but we're giving you this presentation. So not that you want to watch the whole 12 or 20 hours, but um, feel free to take notes, but just know that it is, it is going to be available. Um, but sound is going to be a very interesting part. Uh, I really recommend, we're going to get into the audio part, I think in part three today, that you take the time to walk around uh, your home, your neighborhood, with a set of headphones and a microphone and realize how absolutely fascinating it is to experience life with just your ears. You know, uh, Obviously blind people have to do that because they have no choice, but they have an entirely different appreciation of this world, obviously because they don't have a visual interpretation of it, but they have a very incredible keen sense of hearing. And I, you've got to remember people spend their entire lives as audio technicians and Foley artists, people in little rooms making sounds for movies and they really obsess about it and I find it absolutely a fascinating thing to do. So I really recommend you do that at some point. Uh, dialogue is key. You know, I think going back to collaboration, you're going to want to find people you want to work with that have great ideas, great scripts. Um, one of the key mistakes I made going into film was I thought I had to come up with all my own ideas and write them. And if you look at almost any great film out there, the majority of them, not all, a lot of them are written, uh, the screenplays at least are written. The screenplay is an, often an adaptation of a book or an idea. So, um, you know, what's a recent movie? Um, I mean, almost any movie these days is based on a certain novel or book. So you don't always have to come up with the entire concept. You do have to come up with a dialogue. Uh, but the overarching idea can come from someone else. And that's kind of the beauty of it. Editing. This goes to Ed yesterday, who uh, I think had a great analogy that I've already used a little bit of, which is it's the reason there's a fire there. It's like cooking. You know, editing is the final process of putting all the ingredients together. And I think a key factor that, that he made, which I thought was great, which is what I've always said about a good photographer, does not necessarily equate to being a good editor of your own work as a still photographer. The same goes for editing. Just because, I think he said, if, if, you, um, if you breed cows or certain livestock, and you're the best breeder in the world, and you make the best quality meat, are you going to hire that person to cook your meal? You think about it. <laughs> Just because you're a fantastic farmer doesn't mean you know how to cook. That's a very important analogy, I think, to filmmaking. Just because you're a fantastic storyteller and you know how to get these fantastic ingredients, this fantastic shot here, this fantastic scene or set of dialogue or audio, doesn't mean you know how to put it together. So I have a tremendous respect for editors. In fact, I think it's important for everyone that wants to be a filmmaker of any type to learn how to edit, to do it themselves. But if you can't, at the very least, sit in with your editor and have them explain to you every mistake you're making and how you're making their lives difficult. There's a concept called coverage in filmmaking where you know you're shooting the scene of this gentleman talking to that gentleman. So I want shot A and shot B. But then you've got to give us a little more to cut to, a wide shot a detail of his hands on his knees, a detail of him nodding, to give the editor the right ingredients to put it together. So if you're shooting a farmer out in the field, you're going to shoot an opening shot of this gorgeous farm at sunrise. Then you're going to shoot a picture of the farmer waking up, walking out, a detail of his, of his hand on the handle as he opens the door, a detail of the handle opening open, of the, sorry, the door opening with a silhouette of the farmer walking out into the environment, the key turning on the tractor, him putting his foot and walking up and sitting down on the tractor. It's a series of shots that help you tell a story and take the audience from A to B. It's a very different way of thinking. But you've got to give those ingredients to your editor. And one of the biggest sayings in almost any field these days is garbage in, garbage out. If you don't give those ingredients to your editor, they have to be absolute geniuses to make you look good. And that's why you'll pay some editors a lot of money to help fix your screw-ups. Don't have that shot. Oh my God, how could I have forgotten that shot? A lot of times you don't forget. A lot of times you run out of money. A lot of times you don't have time. The lights break down towards the end. Your camera breaks down. And the pivotal shot in your film never was shot. That's when the almighty editor will swoop in and say, well, if you put this in this way and that here and this here and that here and that here and switch the entire order around, not only can you get away with that and look like a genius, but you can also make it much more interesting. Thank you very much. And uh, I say we go into maybe about uh, 10 minutes of Q&A and then we can come back to the equipment. Perfect, yes. Yes. Uh
I have a question out of the chat room. Um, who inspires you today and who, in your opinion, is doing it right? <laughs> huh. Um, you know, this is a tough question. I've always had, you know, people have always asked me, who's your favorite photographer? Who's your fav favorite filmmaker? I've never had just one. Um, and the I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to kind of escape that one right now because I have so many other things on my mind by just saying that I've always looked to as many photographers you know, when I was a younger guy, I would look at as many magazines, as many as newspapers, in fashion, in photojournalism, in fine art, in all these different fields, like food photography. I, I'll never do food photography. I can say that right now and say between now and the end of my career, I will never likely ever shoot a photograph of a cheeseburger, you know, for Burger King. It's not my thing, okay? I see how those things are done, it's pretty scary. Um, and, but I look at them, I study them. I obsess over them and try to re think about how those people did it. Uh, same goes for filmmaking. I look at documentaries, I look at internet movies, I look at what people are entering into contests, uh, I look at classical movies. You know, for those of you that have never seen an Orson Welles film, a Hitchcock film, a Stanley Kubrick film, I mean, who inspires me today? Uh, I gotta say one of the movies I saw recently, two of them, um, I mean, one was Tarantino's uh, Inglorious Bastards because of the acting and the content, um, I thought that, um, I mean, frankly, I, I tend to go back towards more of the classical films. Any Orson Welles, if you haven't seen Citizen Kane, go out right now and get it. Um, if you haven't seen Hitchcock, by all means, please educate yourself. Uh, Stanley Kubrick, Full Metal Jacket, Blade Runner, uh, Brazil by Terry Gilliam is one of my absolute most fav favorite films. Uh, I also have a fondness for the more Hollywood movies like E.T. Um, Cl Close Encounters of the Third Kind is somewhere in between E.T. and like uh, uh, 2010. Um, and is it 2010 or 2001? Am I doing with it? Cause it's 2001. Right? I know we're in 2010. But I, I kind of <laughs> got that this moment to happen. Um, any film that really just makes you have some sort of visceral or intellectual reaction. You know, Brazil by Terry Gilliam is an example of a film that you're going to have to watch three or four times before you get it. But the concepts behind it are so applicable to today and was made 30 or 40 years ago. Um, and I find that fascinating. Um, I know I'm forgetting a lot of films that I really love. Um, you know, I love the music in The Untouchables. I love that scene with Stroller going down the stairs. I just think that scene is an absolute masterpiece uh, of building tension. So I guess it didn't sk I didn't skirt it too much. But the point is, try to consume as much as you can and try to analyze it. I think the biggest mistake you can make in regards to film is to just sit back and watch it and consume it. You should do that on the first layer and see how it reacts with you. But if you want to study film, you've got to have a pause button. And you've got to go back and watch that same scene three or four times and pay attention to the screenwriting on the first pass, then how the camera moves on the next, how it's cut on the next, how it's lit. There's a fantastic amount of things to look at. Yes? If everything is about the story, do you find still photographers are capable of doing that? Or do you find that developing a great story is dependent on collaboration with the producer and the writer? And you talked to that a bit, but maybe yeah. a little bit more again. I think you'll find photographers and filmmakers who are absolutely incapable of telling a story. <laughs> um, and some that make quite a lot of money doing it. Uh, and you'll find the opposite. Um, some people are born able to do it all by themselves. It exists. I think Spielberg is a good example of someone who has incredible control over everything from start to finish. He has an incredible ability to communicate exactly what he wants to every member of his crew. A lot of us, including myself, need to collaborate with people uh, and welcome it. Uh, the big thing you've got to understand is if you're the director, you know, who doesn't want to be the director? I mean, come on. Uh, until you do it and you realize the amount of responsibility that, that you, you hold. Uh, you have to have an idea of exactly what you're looking for, the end goal, the subtext to your story, but you also have to try and draw out the best in your crew members and have them add layer upon layer upon layer. And that's what I love about filmmaking is you may have an okay visual, but you've got an unbelievable actor with an unbelievable screenplay and it just sings. Add a little music or sound to that and you're gold. Yes. Yeah, um, we were talking about the solo project, being in control, You're basically mm -hmm. being the director as a photographer, yes. and then coming into this collaborative environment. Right. And um, how, can you talk a little bit about where you started with backing off with 
relinquishing that control mm -hmm. and maybe give some thoughts of like from the photographer's perspective I'm just getting into this you know I find it hard to relinquish that control to the creative control and and as 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 you got to uh, get more involved with these films um, you know you had to rely on people and and that sort of is sort of scary for a photographer mm -hmm. um, it's it's scary for everyone it's a massive kick in the head coming from photography going into film and the hardest thing for me was actually not being behind the camera having a camera operator who was actually shooting when I shot the Jamie O'Brien uh, uh, documentary I guess you would call it um, for the underwater stuff that was someone else shooting I wasn't even in the water it's too dangerous um, and all I could do as a director was say I'd like this shot I'd like the shot of the hand going for the water from the other other side I'd like a shot you know going from underneath the water to the top to kind of show the depth and communicate the shots that I was looking to get with another artist another technician and that's really hard because as a still photographer the difference between a good shot is not from here to there it's from here to this a millimeter an inch can make the difference a millisecond between a great photograph and the worst photograph in the world and it's really hard to let go of control so then I started collaborating with people and I made the next mistake which was to say you go into a meeting and you go to work with someone else and say what do you think because to me it was fascinating working with other people I welcomed it I love the collaborative process and for 20 years I've been working by myself granted with art directors and editors but for the most part it's a very solo individualistic way of doing it you know the buck stops with you as a director the buck does also stop with you there has to be one person who knows what their single vision is otherwise it gets to be a disaster uh, I've worked with two other directors on, on Nocturne for example it was difficult uh, I love the directors we all got along really well but it was a good lesson um, that you have to have one person who knows what's going on at all times we all had different skills but we were trying to share a bit too much over you know where the entire piece necessarily went and you have to have one person who has everything make sense in their mind all these little pieces that are disjointed somehow make sense so the mistake I made initially was I would say to people what do you think what do you think what do you think and start considering and everything and the danger with that is that when you elicit comments um, you might get some very good ideas that are absolutely excellent on their own but that won't fit at all into the puzzle you're trying to put together so as a director you have to have a very clear vision of where you want to go you have to be able to communicate clearly and concisely and effectively to the crew members and the different parts of, of the entire process what that vision is where you're trying to head and set a very clear guideline of what this piece is, what type of film is this, what's the mood, what's the look, what's the genre, what are we trying to say, what are the key themes, uh, what are people going to be wearing, what type of light environment are we going to be, is it very, you know, is it a very dynamic, you know, uh, Wizard of Oz color palette, or is it a very subdued uh, color palette with very, very, you know, film noir light. You've got to communicate that with your, with your, uh, your team, and then elicit feedback from them. Does that make sense? You can't yeah. just say, I don't know what I'm doing, I'm going to figure it out on the go. That is the biggest mistake you can make as a director, show up on set the day of the shoot and not really know what your shots are going to be. Not really know where you're trying to go with it and trying to figure out the day of. You will have an epic disaster, I guarantee you. You're really, this is where we were going to the proactive versus reactive, spend a heck of a lot more time pre-producing or doing so much of your work prior to ever showing up on set. The more work you do beforehand, the more smooth your shoot will go. Whereas as a photographer, I found as a photojournalist especially, you want to know what the story of the day was, you want to know what you want to try and get, but you have to be reactive because it's breaking news. No one really knows, you wouldn't be here if you knew what was going to happen, that's part of the excitement. So you have to know generally what's going on in politics and whatnot, but you have to react on the fly to a major change. A very different than filmmaking. Yes? Can you talk about, uh, one of the things you talked about is light can be in constant motion. Give a couple examples of how you might use light in motion to add to a scene. So think about someone riding in a train, for example, at night, or riding in a car, and the light is just washing them on and off. Uh, think about someone walking in an empty warehouse, in and out of puddles of light, so you've got shafts of light coming down, and the person is going from being lit to being completely black and silhouetted, perhaps, to being lit and think about how that can create a certain kind of mystery and a certain kind of feel. So when you feel or you hear, this is a good example, of hearing some footsteps 
coming at you and all you're seeing is a silhouette or even total darkness, it makes the audience fear something that's coming to them. Whereas if you show someone walking up towards you that's completely lit, you give it away. You know, it's, you're a magician as a filmmaker. So many times you want to start from the back of their head. Or you want to show a point of view shot where someone's looking out, but it's actually the person's point of view shot by the camera. And that creates more doubt and fear in people because they don't know what's looking at them. Think about the movie Jaws. You didn't see the shark for a very long time. The better example, I think, is Aliens, where you almost never, ever saw that little thing. Yeah. You know, a little guy with the big teeth until <laughs> later on. And wasn't it much more scary to never see what was chasing them? Just hearing them and seeing people get gob gobbled up and disappear? That's filmmaking. The biggest mistake would have been to reveal that, that you know, ugly looking thing. It was actually, that, that example is a fantastic, uh, you know, makeup job and, and all that. But, you know, how many terrible horror films have you seen where you see the, the, the guys with the horrible makeup on too early and it just kill, kills all emotion? It almost becomes comical at that point. We had a question in the back? From the chat room. This is kind of going back to what you talked about earlier, but you say that photography is more individual mm -hmm. and filmmaking than, and is more collaborative. But what about documentary filmmaking? Is that a good option for some, somewhere, uh, someone who is in between? And would you say that documentaries take just as much, or would you say that it takes just as much collaboration? So uh, documentary filmmaking. That ultimately depends on the size of your crew. But absolutely, documentary is one of those, those places where you can just be by yourself with your camera and the subject. And uh, being a, a photojournalist, you know, in training, or from my background being a photojournalist, can say that the size of the crew is going to kill your documentary. If you've got, you know, five people in the room with two different cameras, a sound operator, a producer, and a director, uh, that kind of kills the natural moment, obviously. So absolutely, documentary is somewhere in between. That being said, oh, this is like a horrible thing to say, reality TV is a form of documentary, you know, to the most obscene, you know, edge of it. But they are trying to supposedly capture what happens at all times with multiple cameras. Obviously they take it to a whole different level where I'm sure, you know, obviously they, they, they make things happen and they orchestrate stuff. But in terms of documentary, it is somewhere in between. But you'll find that um, there's many different ways of doing documentaries. A lot of them involve a lot more people than you're going to see at the end, you know, um, e during the shoot. The, the goal, in my opinion, of a good documentary is to make it look like it's just the camera and the subject in the room and never allow anyone to realize that there's more happening there. Um, and uh, that's, that's kind of one of the big goals. Yeah. Um, Mansoor in Dubai would like to know, oh. um, is there a particular challenge to being married and having a family and having the <laughs> career path that you've chosen? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, uh, that's how many divorced f filmmakers and photographers do you know, or people who've never had families? Um, that is uh, one of the biggest juggling acts of my life, uh, given the amount of travel that I do. One of the big reasons that I'm doing this workshop, uh, I, I had an idea of doing something like this three or four years ago, when I was out with someone, uh, we were talking at, at NAB, um, and we said, you know, we love teaching, we love interacting with people. But there's got to be a better way than leaving our families. You know, even just to speak for 45 minutes somewhere in the U.S. It takes me three days to fly out there, get there that day, and fly back. And you might speak to 100 people that day, or sometimes 10 or 15, or a workshop, you know, less than 12. It's not the most effective way of doing things. That's why today is a very big experiment. You know, you've got, you know, over a few hundred people watching over the Internet live. And, of course, they can, you know, get the download later on and watch it at their leisure. But I think it's a much more effective way of communicating with people, albeit the ridiculous amount of gear we have here in effort. Yes. Yes, another question from the chat room. What do you think holds beginners back the most, and how do you get past that? Uh, what holds beginners back the most is understanding uh, two things. How the shots will come together in the end, so the edit and the storyboarding process, and understanding it's a whole package, it's not just one shot, with the next shot, with the next shot. It's how the first shot transitions to the second shot, making it not abrupt and making it flow from one to the next. And uh, the second, um, probably the most important uh, barrier is to, to more, much more of a degree than in photography, I would say, the gear. So um, handheld shaky video doesn't really cut the mustard. You can get away with it for a certain point. Uh, in film, handheld is a technique 
All right, it's a choice to add drama and when a bomb explodes in a movie scene, you're going to want to have the moments after that with shaky video because it helps add to the tension and the uncertainty and the chaos. If you shoot your entire film with shaky video, you know, like the mom and pop, you know, recital videos, people can't stand watching or the constant zooming in or out. And that's where dollies and steady cams and other, and just on a most simple level, a fluid head, a tripod to stabilize your video comes into play. Uh, let's talk about equipment real quick, <laughs> if we can put that up on the street. And, um, you know, one of the jokes that, you know, some of the people made about me initially um, with this new HDSLR craze is that I had so much gear, you know. Uh, and if anything, it, that would be the number one criticism I would make of myself as a filmmaker during my first year, is that I really got focused on this stuff. And it was important for me because I was learning a new trade. I was learning also how to make these cameras work in the same way as what I was seeing on TV and on movies. It was important to me. I can't stand handheld video, okay? And in fact, these cameras are probably the worst at doing handheld stuff. They really sing on a steady cam or a jib or a dolly like nothing else. We'll get to that. But equipment is key. I think a lot of you see this square contraption on the screen. Uh, I, I, um, that is scary. <laughs> and I'm convinced the keyboard on the back of that gentleman's back is there to allow the director to say, be quiet, I don't care about your opinion, just pan left, pan right, and do what I say. <laughs> um, but yeah. We have, so we have someone in the chat room who would like to know if that is a Ghostbuster. <laughs> you know what? It is more of a chance that he is a Ghostbuster than a filmmaker. Uh, the reality is you can knock this. I do think this is a bit extreme, to say the least. Uh, but technical stuff has become a big part of filmmaking, all right? Uh, because people are constantly trying to push the envelope. Personally, I would love to see in the next 10 years a reversal back towards content and stories. But maybe it's that I'm relatively old. I'm 35 years old, okay? I'm old in like internet terms. I like Orson Welles films. Most people watching this may never even have heard of who Orson Welles was. Um, I, I spoke to one of the gentlemen that works with me, Marcus, uh, the other day. Was it about Star Wars? About, or E.T., how I remember as a child uh, lining up for, for E.T. It was the first movie I ever lined up outside of a theater to go watch the premiere. And Marcus was like, yeah, I wasn't born for that one, so I don't quite have a recollection, <laughs> you know? So different strokes for different folks, you know? Uh, but anyways, this, you know, is a scary thing. So we're not quite going to this extreme. That's actually a very advanced, I think it's an SI2K, a very advanced camera on the front there, and lots of wizardry. Uh, and what we'll talk about is that's cool because it might allow you to get some amazing shots. If I'm correct, I believe it's the same camera that was used in um, Some Dog Millionaire. All right, so the DP had a computer or a recorder in his backpack, I think some, some dry ice around to keep it cold, and was running through the streets, uh, I think it was Mumbai, if I'm correct, uh, with that very camera there and a prime lens on it. Because you cannot run through the streets of Mumbai in very narrow alleyways with an RE camera. You're going to kill yourself and someone else as you run into them. So technology can be your friend. Technology can really be your enemy. We're going to talk about that too. Uh, so you got to know as a filmmaker, just as a photographer, what's in your toolbox, what's available to you, what exists. Uh, if you're trying, uh, you know, I worked for a client recently who described a shot where he wanted me to walk around someone, do a 360 as that person was walking. And I said, well, that's a steady cam move. Do you have the budget for a steady cam operator? He's like, no, 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 no. We can do that handheld. And the answer was, no, we can't. It's physically impossible to, while, well, and Marcus was operating on this one, he can attest to this, trying to walk backwards with a handheld camera with no stabilization on it and trying to do a 360 around someone while they're walking is basically begging for disaster in two realms. One, the footage is going to look awful unless you really, really need that, like, you know, crazy, you know, in the middle of war feel to it. And more than anything, your operator is likely going to trip and fall and hurt themselves and destroy your camera. So know your equipment and know that for certain shots, you do need a steady cam. And for certain shots, you may want to set up a dolly, dolly track so your camera can very smoothly move back, backwards and forwards. You'll also learn that you can spend 15 minutes setting up your dolly shot, but you're only, only going to use a very small section of that dolly. And you might as well have done it with your two legs and your hips and just lean forward and back 
and it'll take you a heck of a lot less time to do that 10 times in a row like this and take the one best take than it will to set up an entire dolly and the equipment needed. Very key concept we'll kind of get into. Um, one of my favorite sayings as a photographer was just because you have it doesn't mean you need to use it. All right? For photographers out there, you know that when you walk out there with that backpack filled with 50 to 70 pounds of gear, which I would do at the Olympics, for example. I've, I've covered four or five Olympics. And you go out there with 70 pounds of gear. You can't move. You don't want to go up there to get that shot. It's too far away. You're dying. You're exhausted. Your back is killing you. You see a picture right there, it's like, oh, what lens do I use? Which one? Oh, no, no, no. You know, sometimes it's nice to have one camera, one lens. Same goes with filmmaking to the worst degree. It's exponentially more difficult. It's great to have a jib with you. It's going to slow you down a tremendous amount. All right? So you got to realize just because you have the gear doesn't mean you need to use it. It's a very, very important key concept that I learned the hard way, again, during my first year of filmmaking with Jamie O'Brien. We shot with the red, and we'll get into that, camera, and I would show my crew at 5 o'clock in the morning. It would take them 45 minutes to get the camera ready at 4 or 5 in the morning in the dark. A camcorder, take it out, turn it on, you're ready to go. Don't lose sight of that. These cameras do certain things really well. Right now, as of today, if I were to shoot a documentary, I would not shoot it on HD DSLRs. I would shoot parts of it on HD DSLRs. Okay? But the logistics of working with this camera on a documentary are going to slow you down. And to me, as a documentary photographer or filmmaker, the story is key. You want those moments. You cannot afford to miss those key moments in that person's life. They're going to happen once. And you can't be saying, hey, Marcus, can you get me the Red Rock Micro, you know, full, follow focusing ring, or I want to switch lenses and miss it. You know, it's a different process. So we'll get to that in a little bit. Camera support and gear. Over the next few days, we're going to do this in stages. All right, we're not, this is also very important. Along with just because you have it doesn't even need to, you mean you need to use it. Just because we're going to show this gear to you over the next three days doesn't mean you need to buy it on a number of levels. A, you may not be able to afford it. B, you don't necessarily need it. And as a, star, a budgeting filmmaker, I have to give you one of the most honest pieces of advice. If you want to learn how to direct and shoot a film, pull out your iPhone, your 3GS, and shoot video on it. And try to string that together into a short film. You will learn so much more about sequencing shots together, about how to transition from shot A to B to C, on how to move the camera, because you won't be obsessed with a jib, a dolly, a lens, an aperture, lighting. Let all that stuff go. If you want to learn to be a good director, a good filmmaker, let all this gear go for a while and think about the story and how the pieces fit together. The problem is with every single one of these pieces of gear, they slow you down, they constrain you, they allow you to only do this thing but not that. With an iPhone or a camcorder or a point and shoot that shoots video, you don't have to worry about this stuff. And I think if you've paid attention to the beginning, that other stuff in here and in here is what films are all about. This is stuff that can be your biggest enemy. So we're going to go over tripods or what they call it in the video and film world, sticks. It's funny, you say, give me some pair of sticks and the photographers look at you and go, what? <laughs> sticks? And you'll find, you know, the language of film and photography are very funny in that they have no correlation to one another. They don't have f-stops in film, they have t-stops. Do they mean the exact same thing? Basically, they're a bit different. They're actually like true f-stops. But, uh, you know, uh, one big joke that I think happens on every film set is you find a PA and you say, go, go, buy me, go, go find me some f-stops. And you send the PA out to find you an f-stop. You know, and they come back eight hours later and say, I've looked everywhere, I can't find an f-stop like the big joke on set or a t-stop or whatever it is. Uh, but different, different uh, terms. Um, so a tripod is going to be one of the very first things you're going to want to invest in as a filmmaker to stop that shaky video. Okay? Tripod is a, a very uh, basic thing. Um, you don't have to buy a $2,000 carbon fiber tripod. You can buy a $20 whatever as long as it's stationary. And one of the biggest discussions we're going to get into is that Everyone has different needs and different budgets, okay? Uh, you can get a Steadicam or a dolly. You can also borrow a wheelchair. 
Many a famous filmmaker has shot some great shots in a wheelchair, being pushed by a crew member. Okay, attracts a lot less attention. Uh, you want the simplest way to stabilize your camera? Take a bolt. You look at this on YouTube for this. On the, on, uh, put a bolt on the ground with a string and screw that into the bottom of your camera and pull up on it. And it kind of creates a natural tension to stabilize it. If you have Brad Pitt in front of you and Angelina Jolie on Mr. and Mrs. Smith, you don't want to have a bolt and a piece <laughs> of string. Okay, and more to the point, you don't want to have a $300 fluid head or tripod that slips on you or that can't support the weight. When you're photographing or filming Mr. and Mrs. Smith or a big major blockbuster, you're going to want to have a five or ten or twenty thousand dollar fluid head, which is the next thing we're going to talk about. A fluid head is basically the uh, tripod head. All right. If you own, do we have those, Marcus? This is where we start with the gear, right here. Um, if this is what your tripod head looks right, like right now, if you're a photographer, you are not going to be able to pull off a nice pan and tilt off of this head. Okay? It's just not meant for it. It's meant to lock in place. It is not meant to do a smooth pan or tilt. All right? uh, this head right here, which is an O'Connor head, I probably want to switch to the other camera, is a $5,000 head. Most of you that are buying a $700 camera are very likely not going to invest in a $5,000 fluid head. If you're shooting a film that you are putting a certain amount of money into, I will not go shoot anything without this head. Okay, that's just me. That's a level that I want to aspire to because this allows me to make films that are so much better looking in terms of the way the camera moves than, this is not even a good example, than one of the cheaper heads. But that's me. Um, this here is a, do we have the 503 or is it locked down on something? Okay. This uh, is a Gitso 2180, and uh, we're going to have slides for these later on. So um, I know some of you are going to start clamoring for, what's the name of that again, and where can we get it? That's coming. All right, we're going to go over these. This is the only one that is not going to be up there. So it's a Gitso, G-I-T-Z-O, 2180. This is a good way to start, okay? It's 180 bucks, I believe, and it's got a very basic fluid head on it. Here's the key. Every photographer that I know, you know, we get we, the tripods and the, the heads say 20 pounds maximum or 5 pounds maximum. We all load them up with 200 pounds and wait till the thing almost is breaking off until we stop it. We're taking a still image. We don't care how to move. The biggest thing in any one of these video gears, they all have ratings over how much weight they can take. They start to really not perform when they're overweight. So this head is cool with a bare 5D Mark II and a small lens. Not a saying 200. Not a 500 millimeter f4, <laughs> but a 20 millimeter on a 5D. This is a good starting point for 180 bucks. I would not recommend you try to make an independent film with this head. That being said, there is something to be said for how small and lightweight it is. And I'll pass that around. Um, and I'm getting a little ahead of myself here because we're going to go over these again one at a time. We're going to let the people here actually interact with them. Uh, this is a 501 HDV. Again, this slide will definitely come up in like a, an hour or two with the image of it, the price, and the link. It's coming. Um, this is a 300 something dollar head, and it's actually pretty good. The main thing is, though, it screws into um, a, a regular trap. It doesn't have a bowl on it. So as you try to level it, um, it's going to be a bit of a nightmare. And we'll get into that again. We're going to go over that slowly and take our time. But you know, what I'm trying to make initially is you've got a $180 head, you've got a $300 head, uh, back here on a, one of these things is a $2,000 head, and you've got a $5,000 head. We're going to go do that throughout this workshop. We're going to show you the low end, the middle end, and the high end on everything, because everyone has different needs and expectations. All right, you probably don't need a $5,000 O'Connor when you're starting off. You'll look really good at what you do. <laughs> Um, but it's probably very, very well out of your budget. Personally, at what I, level I'm trying to produce, I won't leave home without it. It's one of the things that is absolutely part of my basic kit. I am in love with this tripod. And you know when you have certain pieces of gear that you're actually in love with? I can say that about the O'Connor, because when you, you can touch it with one pinky with a 50-pound camera, and it moves like butter. And you can start going in one direction and change your mind, and not have it, you know, bump. Okay. 
Sliders, uh, we'll go over that as well. A slider uh, is, do you wanna, well, I'll, I'll kinda walk back here, is this contraption here. And basically, I don't know if you can see it on the live broadcast, you can slide when you unlock it, the camera from left to right, all right, in a very smooth fashion, or forward and backward, or up and down, whatever you wanna do. It's a very simple way of getting the camera from point A to B in a straight line, smoothly, okay? Um, we'll talk about that in detail, and you guys will get to interact with it. And I'm gonna show you four, uh, three different sliders and different price points, and you'll immediately get why you'd spend $300 on one versus $2,000 on the other, okay? Uh, dollies are simply tracks with some sort of vice upon it. Uh, they start from very basic, to uh, we have the micro dolly here, which is a great way to start. It's tracks you can lay down by yourself. It's very light, you can pack it with you. You can even take it on the carry-on, uh, on board the plane, that's how compact it is. And I love it for what it is. We'll talk about how a slider can be a heck of a lot more useful than a dolly because your ground isn't even and you don't want to spend two hours leveling the tracks. And then we'll talk about, we're not gonna show you unfortunately a fisher because we don't have room for it. You know, the idea of riding on a dolly as an operator. That's a bit high-end for, I think, 99% of the audience here. A jib is one of these things back here. It's a way to make that MTV move where the camera's swooshing through the audience. Uh, please never do one of those shots if you can afford to do the whole the swooping down shot in the film. You know, this is one of the most poorly used tools in television that I think in filmmaking, when used well, is one of the most important storytelling devices. Uh, so we'll talk about, again, that's the micro dolly. We'll get to it. We also have a porta jib, um, um, jib that is both a slider and a, and a jib. Pretty cool. So these are the different tools. Uh, we're also going to throw in a steady cam uh, towards the end. Um, you know, Rocky uh, was, one, was the first film with a steady cam where Rocky is running up the stairs. Uh, if you remember um, uh, The Shining as well was also one of the very first movies where you got the little kid on the tricycle going through the hallways and you've got uh, one of the founders, the guy who invented the Steadicam, backpedaling with him and allowing the camera to just flow around uh, the scene. If you watch any live TV, you'll see these guys with a big jacket around them with an arm and a spring on it that allows the camera to just kind of float in midair. And it's one of the most fascinating tools um, in film we're going to show it to you here. We're probably not going to use it in our, um, in our little live shoots that we're going to do because uh, that's really one of the areas that I think, you know, you can't just pick up the steady cam and know what you're doing. People take week-long courses and spend years of their lives perfecting how to use that. So the steady cam is a fantastic tool, but like a lot of gear, I would say it must come with an operator that knows what he or she is doing. All right, so we'll talk about that. Uh, time management, one of my favorite acronyms in life, which I really wish I could follow, is KISS. Keep it simple. Stupid. You said it, I did. Okay? <laughs> I'm the stupid sometimes, or most of the time. I don't keep it simple. I overthink things. I try to make something too complex. All right? Keep it simple in anything you do in life. Go from point A to point B with the least amount of resistance in between. You see a brick wall in front of you? Don't think about how fast you're gonna run through it or how you're gonna hold your elbows. How about walking around it, okay? It really applies to filmmaking because you have a lot of different considerations you're gonna make when you're trying to pull off any shot. And there's a big risk versus reward thing in any film, okay? You can do a very simple shot or a very complex shot. Never forget that you can probably pull off two, three, or four simple shots, if not 10, in the time it'll take you to, com to take one complex shot. And you may absolutely fail on the complex shot and have nothing to show for that one hour. Whereas, you know what? That's where the editor comes in. If you don't have the gear, just use what you have. Don't go crazy, okay? Which brings us to Reverie. Uh, Reverie, uh, to me, is a very, successful bad cologne commercial okay the story behind it quickly is that I was going to have lunch at Canon to meet someone they canceled their date 
It was supposed to be on a Wednesday, and they said, come, or Tuesday, come back on a Thursday or Friday. And I picked Friday randomly. I show up to Canon to see my friend, and as I'm walking in, I see these white boxes being pulled out of a case. And I know what those are. Those are prototypes of something I'm not supposed to see. And the person who was pulling them out absolutely freaked out. At, if he were at, working at Apple, a trap door would have opened up and he would have <laughs> fallen down to his death for allowing me to see that camera body. Granted, people should know that I work with Canon uh, as one of their explorers of light. Uh, that's one of the few endorsement relationships I have. Um, and, you know, I'm somewhat part of the family um, to a certain degree in that, you know, that's, that's the camera that I've chosen to work with. And uh, my being there was not the biggest breach of anything. But they did make me sign a non-disclosure agreement immediately. In other words, if I told anyone, they would take my house and steal my kids away. Um, and they showed me the prototype of the 5D Mark II. Here's the key. They were setting that camera out to three other photographers, not to me. But when I saw that camera, that little light above my head didn't kind of go on, it exploded and burst. And I said, I have to have this camera. I have to use it. This is the most amazing thing I've ever seen. Some of you may remember what you, of those of you who saw Reverie, how you reacted when you first saw that, that film. It was a pretty visceral reaction from a lot of people because to that date, we had never seen, you know, 24 by 36 full frame footage with a still lens coming out and anything that was affordable to us. The only thing we had was to go to a major motion picture. And here I was with a small little body right here with this lens actually. And we were walking around the Canon offices and my jaw was absolutely dropping. Keep in mind this was so new that they didn't know what format they shot it. When they gave me the 5D Mark II, they didn't give me a manual. Um, I didn't know this, so I put the, the little asterisk button. We use back button autofocus in, in still, so you can shoot with your index finger, and you can autofocus with the back button. I did that automatically. I didn't know that I was canceling out the only exposure lock that existed at the time. I had no manual. So Reverie was shot in full auto. And you'll notice that there's one shot where you pan down the Chrysler building, you can see the iris closing down. But Reverie was shot in full auto because I didn't have a manual. I had to speak that night, so I found out the camera existed at noon. By 4 p.m., I, I convinced them to lend it to me. And that night, I was speaking at an event, and I had my assistant, uh, Mike Eisler, in the car. Uh, it was rainy, I'll never forget. I left him in a dark car with the camera and said, figure it out, because I got to speak and we got to shoot tomorrow. Uh, again, I was not supposed to be given this camera. I begged and begged and begged. And on the seventh time that I asked them, I said, listen, <laughs> these cameras are going to sit in a FedEx warehouse all weekend. Just let me borrow it for you know, the weekend. I'll ship it to the photographer who was selected on Monday. I just want to see what happens. And Canon said, all right, just enough already. We'll lend it to you. Just you know, ship it on Monday and write us an email about what you think about the camera. That's all that they wanted. And they said, you know, we're not sponsoring you. We're not paying you anything. We don't have any budget for this. You're on your own. Whatever you produce is your own. Just go ahead and have fun. And we don't expect anything in, in return. I knew I wanted to do something. I had no idea it was going to be Reverie. And uh, I ran out. I was on stage de de delivering a speech and getting iPhone pictures of models. And at first, I only wanted one model because I didn't have any money. My wife convinced me to get a male and a female model. And I knew I wanted a helicopter. You know, we all have our vices. That's mine. <laughs> uh, a helicopter is obviously not one of the cheapest ways to move around. Uh, but that's my background as an aerial photographer, in part. And um, that night at midnight, I had my friend Yoni Brook, who was my intern when I was at the New York Times as, as a staff photographer myself, who was now a documentary filmmaker. I had him come with me and help me put together a shot list. We didn't have a storyboard. We had a basic shot list. And again, I left Canon at 4 p.m. on Friday. I yelled action at 4 p.m. on Saturday. And we shot over two nights in New York. We didn't have film permits. We didn't have location scouts. We didn't have any budget. We had three people with my car two models, a makeup artist, and a cap. And what you'll see next is Reverie. Uh, keep in mind, it was shot um, with the gear I had available to me. This is very, very key. As you watch this, realize I didn't have cinema lighting. I didn't have dollies, jibs, follow focusing units, ND filters. I had nothing. I had one piece of equipment because I wasn't too dumb. I asked them at Canon if I could borrow a set of sticks and a fluid head. That's literally the only video gear that I had, other than my still lenses and a, a one prototype Canon 5D Mark II with one battery. So every, every was shot over two nights, 
Here's a short piece if you haven't seen it yet. Uh, what I want you to keep in mind is, in, what I would like you to keep in mind as you look at this film, is see how the camera moves, given the lack of gear that I had. Pay attention to it and think about it. And uh, here we go. I want you to realize how the timing of this happened. I started, I wrote a piece two years ago called The Cloud is Falling that was written about six to eight months prior to what the economy turning and what happened to the print industry happening uh, that actually sadly ended up being pretty on target. And then Newsweek sent me to cover the Beijing Olympics and they realized they didn't have an issue to publish in the middle of it so they asked us to blog. So that allowed a lot of people to start following me as I was blogging every day from Newsweek. I didn't like blogging. I thought blogging was like the, the worst way to like, you know, self-promote yourself. And then I read blogs like Chase Jarvis, uh, Rob Haggart's A Photo Editor, uh, David Hobby's Strobist, uh, Andrew Hetherington's What's Jack and Ori. Uh, blogs that to me uh, really hit a chord because they weren't about self-promotion. They were about sharing information. And I said, you know what? That's actually pretty cool. Like, I really don't care how cool you are or what you last shot, uh, unless this content is really that interesting. But if you're going to talk about concepts and you're going to share information, that to me started to make sense. So I started blogging at the Beijing Olympics. But I, what I really want you to understand is this was shot in two nights on a self-imposed budget of $5,000, which for a lot of you is a lot of money. I realize that. Uh, for a photographer, $5,000 for a commercial photographer is what I would spend to send out a few thousand mailers across the United States to editors. Do you think I should have spent $5,000 on mailers or on this? There's not even a question to me. The beauty of it though is uh, 10 years ago you had to know someone at Universal Studios or Warner Brothers or a big studio or television show, uh, a broadcaster, to get the kind of audience that I got. What did I use? I used a free WordPress blog and uh, a video player that was free that cost me nothing. 
Uh, turns out it had so much bandwidth being used that it had more bandwidth used on those two days for all of Canon USA than they would for the entire year for their printers, photography, everything. <laughs> so they got, a, they got a little bit of a shock there. But uh, the point is, I use stuff that's available to every single one of you out there. And that is, to me, one of the most key points I don't want to forget. You have access, albeit look at the world around you, newspapers are declining, magazines are declining, oh my god, the end of the, end of the world is near. No, I mean, you have access to this stuff that we could never have imagined of five years ago. No one could ever have gotten a video that they produced in two nights in front of two million people. It's been seen over five million times. This thing was seen by more people in one week than some movies are seen in their opening weekend, okay, that have millions of dollars behind it. So that's a fascinating time to be part of this world where it's about your ideas, it's about the content and how it goes viscerally across people. You know, people, I think, are hopefully caring less and less about how glamorous your Transformer movie is and more about your ideas. So r r keep in mind the technology that was out there and how, I think how important that is. And how you all, that's the key. You don't have to be Spielberg or George Lucas or Michael Bay, strange selection of directors, uh, to <laughs> get movies out uh, to a mass audience anymore. You can have your laptop with your iMovie on it that comes free and a $700 camera and a $20 lens. And if you have a great idea and you're intelligent about how you tell that idea or that story, you can have an audience that is unlimited as long as people have access to the internet. And that has never happened in the history of time that I can see. And I think that's why it's the most fascinating time to be part of this world. And it keeps me up all night and super excited. So here's Reverie again. I'm going to try this uh, shot by shot. That very first shot is one that got a lot of attention because, you know, we'll talk about standard video cameras, but you saw how out of focus the background went and the beautiful bokeh, which is what the word is for that, how a light becomes this beautiful circle, uh, happen on that one shot. So there's that bokeh we're talking about. And that's something that people hadn't seen from uh, cameras out there uh, before. You know, try and get an out of focus background with an average camcorder is impossible. When people saw that shot, they went, oh, wait a minute, what's going on here? The next shot, you can see Jimmy's feet are completely out of focus. That was shot with an 85 on his couch, on my couch, actually, sorry. Um, and again, that, that the light was actually being emanated from the TV. Uh, I had my laptop plugged into my TV with Photoshop open and I was using a saturation slider and the lightness to go up and down to create the flickering. Now two things happened there. One, I used technology to make it happen. Two, the camera was sensitive enough to pick up that light. The average film camera or camcorder is not sensitive enough to pick off the light off your TV and have that be a light source. An iPhone, people, is enough of a light source these days to shoot with these cameras. That's revolutionary. Here we are driving down the tunnel. Here's a that shot was mounted on the side of my car. We'll show you examples of that. This is pro probably one of the more you know, recognizable shots of the film. That was a fluid head. That was the only time that I actually used a video piece of gear. Everything else here is mostly handheld or mounted either onto the car itself or the helicopter. I didn't have steady cams. I didn't have dollies or jibs. And I remember getting slammed by some cinema people saying, this guy doesn't know anything about motion or moving the camera. And I was like, no, I think I do but I'm smart enough to not try to do a Steadicam move without a Steadicam. And I was also afraid of the Jello effect that we all were going to talk mm -hmm. about. And uh, I didn't want to do whip pans and stuff like that. But more importantly, I didn't have the gear. So I used what I had. And that's what you guys should all do as filmmakers that are starting. Use what you have. Don't worry about what you don't have. So three suction cups in the front of my car. There was a police light on the side of the, of the car. Uh, that's what those red and white lights are. This is natural light at 2 o'clock in the morning or 3 o'clock in the morning. It's a 402 weight, granted, not something everyone's going to have, but I had it as, as a former sports photographer. It's just two light bulbs in the background creating a huge bokeh on a silhouette of a woman. In this case, Alex, the model. And here we go. Driving uh, by the UN, you noticed I burned a red light on that one. Uh, this was a pretty fascinating shot of uh, Alex. The red light in front of her are the brake lights from my car, and behind is another car's headlights. You can't do that with the average camera. We'll talk about the low-light performance of these cameras. Handheld in Times Square, driving at 3 o'clock in the morning. All right, uh, 
sodium vapor light lighting Jimmy for the most part, a macro lens there. So the funny part about this shot here is I showed the shot of Jimmy driving through the Brooklyn Bridge and I was actually asked by some very well-known DPs, you know, ASC members, top directors of photography in the world, how did you light the bridge? Well, we're all getting a little shocked at that, but that's the way films are made, people. You can't see the Brooklyn Bridge with the average camera. It's too dark. So if you have a scene on the Brooklyn Bridge, you're going to spend thousands upon thousands of dollars with really powerful expensive lights and generators and cabling to light one of the towers of the Brooklyn Bridge for your key shot. Here I was, this 33 or 34 year old guy with a camera mounted on the front of my car, having ASC members asking me how I lit the bridge. And when I told them that's natural light, they were like, what? That's not possible. Because they've all shot big time movies on the Brooklyn Bridge. And as far as lighting Jimmy's face, we'll show this in a little bit. It's a little light panel, LED light, that's on my steering wheel. In retrospect, I don't recommend you have your main character driving a vehicle with sunglasses and a light staring in their face <laughs> at night. If you look really carefully on certain shots of river, you'll see the, si the passenger side the seat is all the way back because I'm leaning back there looking and saying, slow down, there's a car in front of you. He couldn't see anything. All right, it was like driving with Mr. Magoo. In <laughs> retrospect, it was pretty dangerous and stupid and foolish, uh, but we did do it at three o'clock in the morning, so it was minimal traffic. I don't, you know, <laughs> these are creative and professional actors and stunt people. Don't do this, don't try this at home, right? All right, so here we go. Let's go back to uh, Reverie. Uh, don't have lights? Don't go to the darkest part of your neighborhood. Go to Times Square. It's like, you know, the most expensive lighting you can buy by mankind. That's where I went, Times Square. And then, yes, the helicopter. Um, this was the one shot with him with the glasses. That was the purpose of my film. I wanted the moment I thought of Reverie, I said, I want one shot. I want a shot where you can see the Empire State Building reflected in the guy's glasses. You know, just like a photographer would go towards an image and say, I want that image, this whole film to me was built around that one shot of Jimmy, you know, outside the helicopter at sunset or after sunset with the lights reflected in the glasses. Someone had a question. Okay. What does the, uh, the mount system look like on that helicopter shot? It's called my arms. <laughs> it's me holding the camera. We're both harnessed in so we can't fall out. Uh, we had one light panel on a monopod that my assistant was holding that also had a safety harness into it. And I believe I had for that shot a Kenyon Labs gyro, a little KSA gyro, which is what any you know, aerial photographer will have to stabilize it a little bit. But frankly, it doesn't do much. Uh, for video, you need more than that. I've learned since. But um, it was my arms. And I was rack focusing the old fashioned way, the way as you guys do with a Canon lens, with my hand and guessing. And I would say, this is where the end point is, and this is where the start point is. It was very old school back then. We, like I said, this was not this preconceived thing where we had three, three months to pre plan it. We had like 30 minutes to pre plan. Okay, let's go back to the, to the shoot. And the funny part about the helicopter, a lot of people saw that and said, there's no way this guy did this on his weekend. This is, you know, this is bold. You know, he was obviously had a big budget and whatnot. The truth is, this is what I do for a living is aerial photography. So I just called up the helicopter charter place and up I went. So uh, you may have missed that shot of the rotating camera, the kind of the psycho shot. Uh, that is not what we'll be showing you today, a complicated dolly move with a head that rotates. That's me standing on my feet and lowering myself as I rotate the camera three or four times in a row, okay? Don't get lost in this stuff. It's cool if you have to execute on demand, but it slows you a lot down compared to doing it by hand. And the beauty of these cameras is that you can do it by hand. And there you go. A uh, little Dutch shot at the end, uh, which is a way to say the camera was rotated. Um, you know, this, this thing was uh, life-changing for me. Um, I was invited to see the president of Disney uh, and show this to him in the private screening room. I was invited to uh, Industrial Light and Magic in front of three to 500 people on a 50-foot screen to show this. Uh, invited to the Academy of, of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences, the guys that did the Oscar. And my level of experience in filmmaking was about uh, 48 hours, okay? But it speaks to what this technology did. It's a very disruptive force and a very, very fascinating time to be involved in all of this. I'm going to quickly share with you 
a little behind the scenes footage uh, from Reverie so you can see how it was done and that it's not a lie. Uh, it was just me with my car uh, out at night in New York. Uh, so here's, uh, luckily we made this little behind the scenes video. And uh, I gotta tell you, it was a blast that we had a great, great time. So here's a little yellow light that I had in the back of my car. These are the three suction cups we mounted to the front of the car. This was a prototype, so we put a ca camera armor rubber thing around it so people couldn't see that it was different because it was pretty much the same shape as the 5D Mark 5D. And, you know, had tourists like that shot a picture of the prototype, Canon Inc. would have been freaked out. <laughs> um, and here we are driving at 3 o'clock in the morning down Times Square with three suction cups on the hood of my car. You, there's the raw footage out of the camera on 8512. You can't do that with a Panavision camera. It'll rip the hood off of your car due to the weight. With this camera, you can. Here is uh, my setup for the aerial. It's uh, mounted on a monopod, and you can see that's Mike walking there with me. I'm discussing the shots I'm going to do with the pilot. And uh, this next shot, it's something you have to have a Cineflex or you know, a quarter million dollar Westcam to pull off. Uh, here I am doing it with a monopod, sticking a camera beneath my legs. Uh, granted, it has safety and stuff like that. Uh, here we are at night, uh, shooting the Brooklyn Bridge in available light. It's not as smooth as professional video can be, but it was what it was. Uh, here's our car packed to the brim. And this next shot, Canon was really not too happy about. Uh, seeing their th one of three prototypes in the country, you know, cooked off to the side of my car. Uh, but they forgave me over time. Uh, here's a beauty dish, a Pro Photo 7B head. We used the modeling lamp on it to light the models. I didn't have video lighting, so we'd press the button down for 30 seconds. We had a modeling lamp. Uh, here is Alex on the street, and um, Evan would press the, uh, the, the modeling light on, and this is what we would get. That's all natural light in the background, and this is the uh, still image we got out of it. I'll stop here because when people saw this, that was groundbreaking because, again, very famous DPs and directors said, how did you light the downtown Dumbo, you know, area? It's so dark, it's horrible yellow, you know, sodium vapor and tungsten lighting. You can't even shoot there. So how'd you light it on a budget? I said I didn't light it. That's natural light with just one added light source. Did you balance your uh, pro photos? No, I didn't. It was, they're tungsten, it's tungsten. Close enough. Uh, didn't have time. We weren't trying to make anything special. We were just having fun. I mean, really just kind of messing around over the weekend is what Reverie was. It wasn't trying to do anything that's happened since. It was really, let's play around with the camera. Well, what's amazing is it's auto exposure. And it's all auto exposure. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Reverie would have been a disaster had I shot during the day. I didn't own ND filters. We'll talk about that if you don't know what they are. Neutral density filters, filters that cut the amount of light coming down. Everything was an overcast day would have been shot at F11 and looked like video. Why did I pick nighttime? Why do you guys think I picked nighttime? No permits. Two reasons. <laughs> no, no permits, yeah. less people, less cops, more and important. What doesn't change at nighttime? Ambient light. Ambient light. Ambient light stays constant. constant. Don't have to worry about it. All right? So there's a, there was a little bit of thinking behind this, and it was kind of fun. So I'll go back to it. Um, here we are uh, editing on Final Cut Pro. Um, that's my server, uh, the beast that it is. That's Yoni, the co-director. You saw Andre there. There's the mastermind behind us, my son Noah, Evan. You'll see the clock there. It says like 3 o'clock in the morning or something. It's Mike. And uh, here's uh, a very advanced steady cam system. <laughs> I mean, I'm not joking. That's what I had. Someone holding my belt and a little gyro on the bottom to add weight to the camera. I didn't, you didn't have steady. My advanced lighting. Uh, we used our pro photo lights, which are not video lights, not meant to be used like this, and didn't have enough light, so I used a light from the back and the mirror to shine it back on his face from the front. Handheld, nothing fancy. Remember I talked about plugging the laptop in? There's the Photoshop slider doing the flickering on Jimmy's face. Uh, very advanced support system, I'm on a pillow. That's what motion picture crews do, they use sandbags and uh, Apple boxes. 100 macro. Not a lens you'd have easy access to on a RE 35 millimeter camera. Here's my quote unquote hero shot with the glasses. A little rack focused on by hand. The 4028 shot with two lights in the background. And uh, the overhead. And, and Moby's, you know, uh, one of my favorite artists out there. And uh, he was cool enough to let me and any one of you use his music for any non commercial purpose. So you go to Moby Gratis, M O B Y. G-R-A-T-I-S dot com 
and uh, you can go ahead and use certain one of uh, certain tracks that he's made. Oh, here's here's the real mastermind behind this. <laughs> That's my son Noah. Just so you realize the spirit in which this was made. This was not meant to be this uh, big self-promotional anything. Um, but basically, um, I think we're done with part one. But um, speaking again to Moby, Moby realizes the need for artists to use good music because films can't be good if they don't have good music to a certain degree. I think it's mostly true. Uh, and he has this site, Moby Gratis, that allows uh, independent filmmakers to uh, use his, his music for that purpose. Obviously, we had to license it because it went on Canon's site. Um, and that's a very difficult thing to do. Uh, to get permission from someone is easy. To get lawyers to actually write you documents. I have the, written, the, the printed documents one year after Reverie came out. Okay, but I got all the permission from Moby and uh, his, his reps. And I know people will ask, how do you do that? I happen to have my stepfather uh, is a copyright attorney who does music. So he knew people to try and get that fast forwarded um, because you don't want to get sued. And don't forget that just like you don't want photographers ripping off your images or your films, don't rip off musicians' work. That's how they make a living too. At the very least, contact them, get their permission, and realize that hopefully they'll be willing to allow you to use their music in exchange for a credit because hopefully a lot of iTunes clicks will go their way. But don't rip people's music off in the same way you don't rip off um, anything, hopefully. Uh, because um, we all want access to information. Unfortunately, a lot of us have come accustomed to thinking you don't have to pay for it. And I, I respect the need for information. I expect the need to share. But just like we hopefully will sell a few uh, of these downloads to help pay for all the people that are here, all the gear, all the shipping, uh, artists need to make a living doing this so we can continue doing it. We need to feed ourselves. And it's a very important concept. I don't want to belabor it. That ends part one. Thank you.